Happy Saturday, the first of two um, live streams that will be coming at you today. Uh, this one, Midnight Express, and uh, our overnight show. Working on a pretty special guest. I don't know if I'm going to be able to line them up, so I'm not going to tell you who it is yet because there's a 50-50, if that, that I'll be able to get this particular person or people on um so but like i said you'll you know as soon as i get some kind of verification i'll let you know but other than that it's just going to be our tomorrow night standard show i am going to um i am going to have some guests on like i said i am looking for one particular key one but we got a, a star trek themed guest that we'll have on tomorrow we'll talk some more wrestling we'll talk whatever we're talking you know some more heavy metal uh depending on what, what's uh you know what you guys want to talk about Right now, um, I don't see, unless I wake up tomorrow to whatever tweets are happening or whatever breaking news, don't see any breaking news. I saw the Momoa thing, and it's like, you know what, that's just more riddles and shit. So right now, I am uh, <clears throat> resolved to not get too excited about any of the James Gunn stuff until, you know, we actually have something to get excited for. And even then, even then, we just not forget that there is a really long time till we get these movies. We don't even have a script yet for Superman. So we're talking like one to two years from now. So it's just, you know, one way or another, I, I, I don't know if I could get excited for something that's going to happen, you know, that far away. We're talking 2025 possibly. I mean, we just barely got in 2023. So, which is um, like I said, uh, that's plenty enough time to wrap up a lot of things if they so choose. So let's say hi to the chat. Uh, yes, everybody hit the like button. Thank you, Hal. How you doing, Chappie? Long time to see. Fourth one thousand. What's going on? Protest X. Let's go for integrity one. That exact matter to it. Um, I'm gonna say this. I think if if there's anybody with a brain in their head, and all of this madness, some type of resolution needs to be inevitable. What form it comes in, I don't know. How you doing, Jared? Which new HBO show are you talking about? Last of Us? Yes. Yes, we uh I watched Last of Us. I did my 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 solo review on it a couple of days ago. Uh we'll probably do a um we'll probably do a spoiler review for episode two either Sunday night or possibly Monday night just to give people a chance to watch it. All of us haven't been able to get on the same page as far as the people who I do the show with. And the only aspect that I can give you is the is the one that um, is not from a gamer, whereas other people that we bring on are gamers. So I've been drinking. Okay, hey, it's Friday night. As long as you're not behind the wheel, have fun, man. What's your take on possibly seeing some Guardians of the Galaxy? In the day? Uh, I've never had um, any issue with with um, with um, People from Marvel, you know, any any other company coming over and taking a job. But to me, it's just an acting job. I don't see companies when it comes to that. I would um, I would have expected it though, because a lot of times, if you have a good relationship with a group of actors and a group of people, it just makes life a lot easier to work with those people. Again, you know their tendencies, they know yours, you know their expectation, they know yours. It's just you know it's almost like a family atmosphere to where you, you know, the feeling out process is already out the door. He's worked with these guys for almost 10 years now. So I would expect uh, if he wants to have any high degree of success, he, he, you know, the way this thing is being kicked off, I think is horrendous, but if he's going to be successful, he needs to put all the odds in his favor and surrounding yourself with familiar people is one of those ways. That's a good idea. I think. Drinking tea because I am trying to fight off a cold. Murder mystery time. <laughs> I don't know if there's any murder mysteries out there. I mean, you know, like I said, I, I, I could we could do a whole marathon on that one. Smash the like button. Uh, I, I love the way it reads out. Person toy course waving, and I know what it means, but it's just it's just neat the way it reads up on the thing. All right, pay fourth age, uh, everybody. <laughs> How's gun? I don't know. I haven't seen it. He says it's coming before the end of the month, so we got ten days. So, um, like I said, I, I I don't expect much to be announced, and you know, I even once he announces it, 
I, I just don't know how excited I'm going to be simple because like I said, I'm exhausted when it comes to going through this again. Um, I am still a fan, but you know, I'm going to use my wrestling analogy. I'm at home with my remote watching it, but I'm not where I was, which was in the, in the uh, arena ringside there at the match. I mean, I'm watching this from a safe distance, hoping that there's something for me to gravitate towards. But once again, I just have to see what, how it all holds out with regardless to what he announces. My biggest thing is how are you resolving what's already there? I've, I've said that over and over again, because if it, there's no resolution of some type, no matter what it is, um, what platform it's on, uh, you're always going to have a credibility issue going forward, regardless to whether this is, you know, whose regime fucked up. It still says DC on it. You're the head of DC. So my, my, um, uh, priority and concern would be how how are we resolving what I just spent the last nine years watching as much as it is, as it is okay, who's your actor, who's your Superman? At this point, I don't care because I'm not 100% certain that I want to jump into that, you know, given the current thing I'm on being left in shambles, possibly. Now, if, you know, when he puts out his slate, if resolution is part of that slate, you know, then I'm on. Uh, if it's not, I'm just going to take a wait and see attitude. And I've, I've been continuing to tell people, let the picture come together as they put it to you. Uh, and I'm I'm still um, I'm still committed to that. But what they have to understand, and they what is a major concern, wait and see, is not an option. That um, if I'm DC Studios head, that I want out there. I want you lusting and anticipating this thing from the day I announce it to the moment it gets released. And it's just really hard to do that when the history of the product is what it is. So wait and, wait and see is one step up from apathy and not caring. So I hope when they do make their move, it's, it's a really definitive move. Otherwise, you're talking two years of just sitting around waiting for random tweets and riddles, and I don't think that's good for the product. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I waited from 2013 to now. You got to realize, and, and here's, here's one of the things that um, DC Studios needs to understand, just because they come up with new shit, it's not like Men in Black where he waves around that little wand and it just wipes out your memory of everything that's gone before that sounds cool, like I said, on a Christmas card, but in reality, your history is there. And the history is not finishing what you started. So not only do I run that risk again of jumping into the car with you and not getting to the end of the road, um, I got to wait a long time for it. So that compounds it. So whatever he announces, a, a, a while on top of nine years. So we're waiting, waiting 11 years to get something that's going to stick. It's a lot of time. Come to the store Sunday. We'll be open 12 to 4 Pacific time. Yes, if you are local or you're visiting um, Las Vegas this weekend, I'm having a clearance sale to, well, today, Saturday, and tomorrow and Sunday. Uh, come by. I'm going to be doing uh, giving away some you know pretty decent deals. Got a bunch of new merchandise coming in, and we have a very – you guys have seen my store. We have limited space. Hello, Turin. I have a feeling that the Adam is part of Gun Saffron Slate. Possibly. Like I said, uh, he has a very wide range of characters he can deal with. So I'm just uh, wondering if... Uh, I think the first priority is the A-listers. A the Adam is a B-lister. I don't mind the Adam being there. I don't mind any of these B-listers being there as long as they are a part of the story that's being carried by the A-listers. I keep hearing Lobo. I've been hearing Lobo all day. Listen, I've been collecting a very long time. I have the first uh, my parents of Lobo. I am a Keith Giffen, Keith Giffen fan. I think Lobo is one of the dumbest creations he ever came with, but he actually thought it was one of the dumbest things he uh, came up with. If you look at when Lobo was released, 
he was pretty much barely seldomly used in the 80s. He was pretty much represented and repackaged as a joke in the 90s. And I just never really made a connection with the characters. It's one of the few characters that Keith Giffen, who is a Legion of Superheroes and Legion guy, who is one of my, some of my favorite DC stuff is by Keith Giffen. But I just think Lobo was just a trash character. I just never, I have a Deadpool experience when it comes to them. I was there when Deadpool was created by uh, Rob Liefeld and Pepe and Nikaias. I actually got a chance to talk to those guys at San Diego uh, Comic-Con back in 91 and 92 about the creation of the character. And I, I, Deadpool didn't appear to me uh, when he was the first appearance with New Mutants 98. Didn't appeal to me now. Um, Lobo, even less. I just don't. I think it's a one-dimensional character. It's a bounty hunter who travels through space. Just never had any appeal. Just watch his books come in and get canceled, come in and get canceled. And I just, like I said, now we're talking about getting excited about another B-lister. Less people know who Lobo is and knew who Black Adam was. Less people know who Lobo is and know who Shazam is. There are people who come into comic book stores that don't even know who Lobo is. So I just don't feel like going down that road again. Uh, unless he's part of... Now, if you're going to say he's going to pop up in Superman, great. But once again, we're bringing in... Out of all of Superman's rogue villains, you're going to... Rogue's galleries, you're going to bring in Lobo, who's not really a Superman enemy. So I hope that's not the case. Also, the whole Jason Momoa thing. If he's if he plays Lobo, great. Like I said, I'm not, you know, I'm at that, wow, okay, HBO Max feeling as far as that goes. But when it comes to a lot of fan casting, that's, even before he, he hinted that he may be playing this character, I have fans that are like, oh, he, he, he looks just like him. He's perfect for the role. All day long, I've been hearing things like that. And another one, Dave Batista. He'd be perfect for Bane. He looks just like... Stop that shit, okay? This is why I do not like fan casting. I know fan casting is fun. I know people have put a cottage, made a cottage in, uh, industry out of it. But it's really kind of dumb sometimes. All right? For several reasons. As soon as that particular person who's perfect for the role that the fans think should be casted doesn't get casted by the person who's probably more qualified to cast that, which is the director and the producer, then you got a lot of ill will towards the movie before it even gets made. I don't know how many times that when a director or somebody casted someone that wasn't in the fans, you know, radar, they started shitting on the film before it even happened. So that's one of the things. And two, anybody, listen. There's these things that, that have been, you know, accompanying movie producers and directors for about 100 years. They're called makeup artist, wardrobe, costume, you know, effects, makeup. Anybody can play some of these characters. Just because somebody looks like somebody in another movie that's not the movie that's probably going to get cast in doesn't mean that that guy's the only guy that can play him. I think it's kind of an insult to Dave Patissa that, yeah, he's six foot four and he's big and buff, but oh, he's got to play the, the one dimensional muscle bound knucklehead from Batman's Rogue Gallery. Who, by the way, out of all another issue, out of all of Batman's enemies, why do we keep coming back to Bane? He's a Z lister. Forget A lister, B lister, C. Bane is a C lister who was horribly written even when he first came out. And the things that Bane was able to do during his first story arc were bullshit. And this is coming from a lifelong Batman reader and collector. All right. If you compare Bane up to all of Batman's way more capable enemies, Bane fucking sucks. And yet, if we get him again, it's going to be a third time. Batman has better enemies than that. Dave Bautista, in my opinion, is a better actor than that. I would not, I, I would not want that role or or Dave Bautista's escalating or his his evolving acting credibility to be wasted on a shit character like me. It's like Venom. Everybody wants to bring up oh Venom, Venom. Spider Man has a, about a thousand enemies that are way more exciting, way have way more depth. We always keep coming back to Venom. It's, Venom's been on uh, two different generations have had Venom on there. 
I could go through a list, a telephone book thick list of 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 uh, Spider Man villains that we could have seen way before we saw Venom. So yeah, but when it comes to fan casting, I mean, if we go with the fan casting logic, Jason Momoa is never casted because most fans wanted a blue eyed, blonde haired Beach Boy looking guy. So the first thing is we got to find out what a director and a screenwriter wants and what the script is, and B who that director thinks is right for the job. Just because somebody looks like somebody and has, you know, bulked up like that. Listen, actors go to gyms, you know what, and get built up and put on muscle for roles. You know, did anybody did anybody think he's, you know, Heath Ledger would make a great Joker? No. Did did uh, Colin Farrell look like the Penguin? No, not until he did. He was chosen by the director, and the director and the makeup artist and the visual effects people made him look like he needed to look. We don't, the fan casting, like I said, I know it's fun to a certain extent, but it gets kind of silly. And it's kind of like an insult to the industry. It's like, you don't think a guy can get into a makeup chair and become anything that that director needs him to be? I mean, come on, man. Oh, well. Oh, everybody's saying, oh, how you doing, Drago? Well, he's right. We already waited too long for a reboot. Just to get started, to give us a quick man of steel and wrap this up. Yeah, something. I mean, uh, how you doing, Vince? Let's see. Not, uh, let's see. Like I said, I, I, I do my pitch. Whoever does it, six episodes, wrap this whole thing up. Well, did you see the trailer for Invincible 2? And none at whatsoever. I sold the Invincible comic when it first came out, I think in 2002, 2004. Didn't have any interest in it then. Uh, I did watch the show just because I, you know, I was going to do a, a stream about it. Ended up just not having any interest in it. Uh, I just never, the premise and the story, I just never, I just thought it was too, too, just I couldn't relate to it. Um, it's not better than the boys, but Hey, that's, that's my opinion. Pro X. I think the boys is, um, far superior, even though I like the fact that they tried to translate some of the violence from the, the comic book as much as they could into invincible. It's still not the same. And even comic books, I mean, the boys is, is on a different level in my opinion, but Hey, the Deadpool movies crack me up. Yeah. And like I said, I understand a lot of people like him. I just never made the connection. And as I explained before, I don't go to the movies for slapstick. And a lot of Deadpool is, is appeal. At what he has become since his first appearances has become slapstick. And I just have very little interest in that. That's just a personal preference of mine. That's fine. Um, I want to play Denzel Washington in, uh, in his biopic. You know? And he could probably pull it off, but I what I what my point is the train of thought that just because somebody in their raw form looks like somebody doesn't necessarily mean that that's the person for the role. You could probably get twenty or thirty other guys, and under the right circumstances, the right makeup artist and the right costume or in wardrobe person, that person can be Bane. All right, nine times out of ten, the person who gets these comic book roles doesn't look anything like. The you know, like what you're thinking, you know. I mean, it's just, and like I said, why would you wait? I mean, Dave Batista is become is becoming a great actor. That's not a great role. Bane's a shit character. I, I really, you know, I, I would really, it would really suck to see. Um, um, that's it's a meathead role, and I think he's he's evolved beyond a meathead actor. He's not a meathead actor, and I, I would hate hate to see that role of him. That is your prerogative. Um, I wish I had, like I said, a lot of people, I, I, I've always said before, since this whole thing has come down, regardless to how much you believe in what, that James Gunn can do and pull this off, this rollout has been horrible. And I fear that the rollout and how the thing has been handled could impede. And people seem, oh, they'll be fine. People will forget pundits and other youtubers and we twitter heads and all that i think they think people are stupid 
I think they think people are stupid and that they forget. And I think they think that it, that extends to the, the general fan too. All right. They're like, we're, we're just, you know, uh, you know, pit bulls or something. We only remember certain things. And when, you know, five minutes later, we're on to something else, another chew toy. The human mind doesn't work that way. All right. People remember this stuff. And it, in some, in some cases, it's what they don't remember that hurts you. Like if, if I'm throwing a, Superman out to a general audience, first thing they're going to be, you know, they're reminded of the fact that we haven't had one, you know, and we never had an end to that. They know that there's no end. They think that because they're not hardcore geeks like us on YouTube, that the general fans are just a bunch of dummies that can't remember, you know, how to get home from work. Nah, they remember this stuff. They make up the majority of the audience and their exhaustion is, is a bigger threat to any momentum than ours is. So, uh, a lot of people will remember, you know, they won't remember that they won't know the details that went into to Cavill and all the whole, you know, thing with Warner Brothers, but they don't need to. They just know that that Superman that a lot of people liked was gone, came back, and it was gone again, and now there's another Superman. Just repeat that to yourself. The Superman that was established was kept off the screen for five years, was bought back, and then now he's gone again. If you repeat that to yourself and you realize how stupid that sounds, now you're expecting someone to take that same stupidity and give you their money. You, It's not going to be that easy. Is it impossible? No. But they need to understand that ad, how they've handled this ad, ad, ad could impede their momentum. Uh, de any Deadpool, anything. I, I just... I, <laughs> Like I said, I, I've never cared about that character. And looking like a character leads to typecasting, which usually means no work for an actor. Limited thinking from fans can destroy an actor's career. Do you want to do that to a beloved actor? And it can also destroy the movie because, like I said, how many times have, have we've had people fan casted and then they're I, they're not the ones writing the, 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 the script. They're not the ones directing the movie. But they're gonna put forth their, we you know, which is all right. That's fine. But when it doesn't happen, dude, people forget how shitty people act when 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 they don't get what they think that the character be. Now it's that's not my so and so. That's not my so and so. I can't believe they cast him. That's ridiculous. I'm not gonna see this movie. Movie hasn't even even started shooting yet. And you'll have guys like that that are like, that's why I don't do fan casting. Does Bane have great potential in Matt? No. And Matt Reeves, if you're watching this Poindexter Lounge, if you're watching the Sci-Fi Center Lounge, please, for the love of God, do not put Bane in your movies. You have so many villains, especially for your style of Batman. Bane will be, uh, no. Bane's a shitty character in the comics. Please don't be the third director to put that garbage on the screen. It's a trash character that got that had a high spot. Bane is like a the Bane character is like a wrestler that does a whole bunch of cool high spots and everybody's like, "Ooh, look at that! Oh, he broke Batman's back! Ooh, he figured out who Batman was! Ooh, okay, three or four other better uh, villains have already too. So, and you know, you could use those guys. There's so many other villains. Please don't use Bane. I don't care who you um, who you're thinking about casting. I don't want to see Bane on the screen." Quarter vowels would be perfect for him. Um, you already have the Joker in there. Uh, I would like to see your version of Mr. Freeze. Bane, no. Pass, pass, pass. Please, Matt, don't do it. Yeah, it's time to move off of Bane. Give us some new, yeah, better villains, too. I mean, not just new, better. He's one-dimensional, and that that's saying a lot for Bane's character. All right, some fan castings are lazy, like Anthony Starr, Reverse Flash, and Jamie Alexander is one of them. Yeah, and then some of those characters, I mean, it depends on, um, it's all going to depend on uh, what kind of Amazon you're writing. Because if you're writing a traditional Amazon and she's like nearly six feet tall and she's, she's muscle tone, um, Daniel McMillicor, acquire the, the girl from the rat catcher from uh, Suicide Squad, they're going to have to bulk her up. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying she can't do it, but that's like a far cry from uh, the one you just had. I mean, someone who's nearly six feet tall. Who is athletically built, but makeup, gyms, they could have an effect. So, uh, we're at 26 minutes. People don't think uh, Jason Momoa spoke English after seeing him as Khal Drago, even uh, he didn't get work for years after Game uh, uh, from Game of Thrones. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, because I first saw him as Ronan Dex on Stargate Atlantis. Yeah, he's an American. He speaks English. Oh, Joga. The difference is Anthony Starr is a phenomenal actor and will make an amazing reverse flash. There's a lot of people that are phenomenal actors that would make a reverse flash. That's the thing is like it all depends on what that writer and what that director is doing, you know. What about John Leguizamo now? Oh, by the way, if you haven't seen um, I know Christmas is over, but if you haven't seen um Violet Night, John Leguizamo is great in that. Go see it. It's I think it's on demand now. The boys uh, try too hard to be edginess. So that was ever that if you ever read the comic, the whole point of the boys was was literally to uh make fun of superhero the superhero not make fun of it but to show the superhero genre in a way that it would really happen if you were running it in an uncensored world would <coughs> before dc black label a lot of the stuff even dc was putting out was you couldn't have the kind of edge you weren't doing the kind of violence you know in there like you would with the boys it was it was unfiltered it was basically looking at our traditional superhero world with that edginess so they were that the edginess was their thing. Okie dokie. All right. Oh, it's typecasting because you're basically basing you're you're basing his ability to, to do that role on his appearance. Because everybody you put up for the role is going to be a great actor. It's going to be a certain level of actor too. You know, so you put that. That's your you know common denominator. So, take, so your people. Oh, he looks just like just like Jason Momoa, um, because this character looks like this character. You're you're literally typecasting him into that. That's literally what typecasting is. You know, they, I mean, there are other villains Dave Bautista can play. Dude, have Dave Bautista uh, play Mister Freeze. That would be more of a challenge uh, for him than anything, but yeah, just because he's six foot four, two eighty five with a bunch of muscles, let's make him look like the two, the six foot four, two eighty five muscle guy in the comic. That's typecasting. That's that's literally what that is. You could develop band into something. More, okay, well, you might as well just make a new character. If you make Bane into something specific, but more sophisticated, he's he's not Bane anymore. I mean. Yeah, Batista was in Blade Runner. Jax was cool, but do you know how I feel about uh, the, the first nine minutes of Blade Runner twenty forty nine? He sets the tone for that movie. HBO Max feel uh, feels to have stagnated. It hasn't been fun for a while. Uh, it's about to get real fun because so, there's a lot of movies that I don't think a lot of people are going to go see in the theater. You know, depending on you know how the slate interacts with the movies that are already there, there's going to be a lot of people who are you know who are just going to wait for HBO Max to watch these things. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Uh, it's hard to, I mean, depending on what the cost is. Because uh, it would probably, well, it's Amazon. So, I mean, it's hard to tell when they make a profit because they're a trillion dollar company. They could, they could lose a billion and no one would know. How you doing, Daniel? Uh, okay. I wouldn't, but once again, if you were to say Shia LaBeouf is Bane, and then I get the best makeup artist and the best uh, physical trainer, and um, you know in Hollywood, then I can I can I can make a Bane. If I can make Colin Farrell, if he can, if they can make Colin Farrell and it look like an unrecognizable version of the Penguin, then you can make anybody anything. Because if you look at Tom Hardy, Tom Hardy's a big guy, but he's not a very big guy. He's not the size that Bane is. He's not the bulk that Bane is, yet they made him Bane. So They should have let the Snyderverse finish first and soft reboot transitions, Action Justice League, and Animated. Yeah, yeah, and we've gone over that a lot. I agree with you 100%. Like I said, full disclaimer, we don't know what they have planned. They could have a res. They could have some type of res, even if it's not the one I want. If they find some way to resolve these characters and give these characters a happy send off, I'm all for it. Even if it's not exactly what I what I have in my head, I just I would like to see a resolution. I'm not gonna get in. I, I'm just hesitant to get into the car and go on a road trip with you. When the last road trip we took, you just left me on the side of the road, 
And that's pretty much what it's been to be a DC fan this last nine years. I'm kind of hesitant. I don't want to. I don't want to end out out in the middle of the desert again, walking back to town because you decided that it wasn't going the way you thought it was going to go, and you're going to pull the rug from under me. Right now, I can't tell people to have faith in anything that's coming coming forward because we don't know if they're going to follow through because they never did. So. All right, typecasting is not seeing an actor in his range of acting skills. Seeing Jason Momoa as Lobo only shows that a person sees only one dimension of thinking. It's an insult to a true actor. And makeup artists and costume uh, wardrobe people and uh, makeup effects, special effects people, all those guys make these characters. All right, Preacher of the Car Room, the actress that played Ratcatcher 2 in Suicide Squad, took a selfie with a Wonder Woman thing in the pig. She's our new Wonder Woman. I'm not putting any cycle. No, neither am I. And like I said, if they pick her, you know, she currently doesn't look like any Wonder Woman that I could think of. But once again, gym, crunches, sit-ups, protein shakes, you know, makeup. Cowboy is a very popular Superman. It's unbelievable how they dropped him and so many people want, want him to stand a roll. Yeah, then this is one of the things they're going to have to deal with. Feels like a big troll fest from Gunn. I think there's a lot of misdirection from Gunn. I think he's trying because there's an environment of scoopers and and and, and trades that that he has to he has to keep them on their heels. He cannot let the internet and trades dictate the perception of his product. So I do agree with him there because you know how I think about the trades. I think the trades are full of shit for uh, in, in a large part. They're not liars or conspiracies or anything like that. But they're like heroin de- dealers. They give you just enough to keep you coming back to the corner to get more. Fuck the fuck the whole truth. They give you just enough of that truth that when you you put it in your veins and you're like, I, I I I need more. And then they give you just a little bit more. It's like that song, um, uh, Guns N' Roses, Mr. Brownstone. I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it. So a little, a little bit more and more. Just try, you know. That's that's that song's about heroin. And the trades and in all these credible sources give you the framework of something that may be true. It's not false, but it's just enough to keep you chasing your tail forever. And I think what he's doing is he's trying to circumvent that. Now, where I disagree, and this may change as he allows to to you know release more stuff, he needs a little be a little bit less of a riddle. You know, because right, 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 right now he just gives one, two words answers, and I understand. So once he releases all this stuff, and it comes from him, then it's going to be, you know, I think the troll festing will end because he'll have something to actually talk to us about. At least I'm hoping. <laughs> Hello, we fly anybody home. Point is loud. Ride the lightning. Best. Okay, you know what? There's Dar Scipio. Speaking of troll, uh, hello, we fly anybody home. Uh, point next around, Rise of Lightning is the best Metallica album, and Deckard is human. Come on, don't be so stubborn, my brother. Wake up and see the light. Okay, Rise of Lightning is not the best Metallica album. We've already established that, uh, Injustice for All is. All right, Deckard is a replicant. That's been established in the movies. So, sorry, Darcypio, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to convert you. <laughs> Yeah, you do all right. Still all back to understand that completely. That's why most MCU actors don't get jobs outside the MCU. Maybe a few like Hemsworth, uh, an extraction for airport. Yeah, and like I said, it's um, how you doing, Keely? I just like I said, when when you think of all the people who have done great roles, especially comic book roles, you they've done a such a transformation from what they were that just to get somebody who currently looks like a version of the character on a piece of paper necessarily, I don't know if that's the best thing. <clears throat> he might not, he may look like something, you know, I mean, but a, a certain person may like look the role, but they may not have the, the acting chops that another person who I can put makeup in a wig and can actually act better. I'm not saying Jason Momoa can't act, but I, it, it is not even about Jason Momoa and Dave Bautista. It's to me, it's about the, the habitual, fan casting that and if it were just for fun if we were just having a conversation no problem 
I think we all know that it's not just that, though. These conversations turn into to mallets that we use to beat over uh, the heads of the project itself. All right? It go all the way back to VVS. Go all the way back to um, uh, Man of Steel. Go all the way back to, uh, you know, to Jason Momoa being casted. You know, how many people were bashing that because he wasn't the blonde-haired, blue-eyed surfer dude. All right? So once it once that casting announcement is made and it's not the fan cast wet dream, then they start taking out that mallet and they start going to work. And that's, that creates bad will for a movie before that movie even gets released. And I think we've seen that movie before. I watched Super Mario 1993 the other night. Speaking of Lagazama. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Uh, not a lot. Uh, can you see my fan cast for Lex Luthor is Will Porter. I think he'd be great. He may be. Um, you're probably going to get some guy we've never heard from. Uh, hold on for a second. We uh, That we've never heard of? Oh, how come I just have a white avatar now? That sucks. Hold on. I'm going to have to replace it with me and my belts. Uh, but yeah. Like I said, when whenever you fan cast, just ask yourself: Are you base? What are you basing that on? That's all I ask. Whatever you know, when you when you're talking about fan casting, are you basing that on um, what you saw on a piece of paper, or you know the vision of the character in your head, or like the type of director? Like okay, so like we were talking about the other night. If we know who's directing something and we know who's, you know, we know who's doing the war, you know, a lot of the other aspects of the movie, you could probably make a decent guess of who somebody could be. But like I said, we don't we don't know what the Superman script is. So, you know, we don't even know if Lex Luthor is going to be in it. Batista wants to ban roll. OK, that's wonderful. But is I need more, you know a reason to put him in there. There's a lot of guys that look like Batista that could play that one dimensional role. Why don't I put Batista in a role that actually requires acting because he's becoming a great actor. He's becoming a very good actor. Now he's getting better with each role. And nah. first of all, let's not even put, let's not even make it a topic out of all of the, the enemies that DC has, for Batman and anybody else, why are we even mentioning Bane? That's fucking re- just ridiculous for me. Out of all of Batman's rogue gallery, why are we picking what might be legit one of the worst ones that is that is in there? You know, and it's the same thing with Superman, dude. Next person that does Superman, I need to see Brainiac. I don't need to see Lex Luthor every time we have Superman. All right, 40 years of Lex Luthor, including TV shows and cartoons. Superman has more enemies than Lex Luthor. All right, and I don't, I really don't need to see a Lobo in a Superman movie because he's not even a Superman villain, really. I mean, we keep going back to the same tired. I mean, even the Joker to a certain extent. Now, granted, you've gotten lucky with the Joker because each Joker you've gotten has been like a legendary performance. But Batman has more enemies than that. Clayface, Man Bat. You know, a, a legitimate version of Ra's al Ghul instead of that one that 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 I that I saw in, in the Nolan series, which I, I did not like. It was one of the main things I hated about that that movie. That it was slow and it was boring. But give me a, a legit uh Ra's al Ghul. Let's do that. I mean, there's so many other uh Batman enemies out there. Bane shouldn't even be in a conversation. All right? It's like Venom. Venom, you know, that's one of the things that ruins Spider-Man 3. Why are we shoehorning Venom? You know, a character who at that point had only been around like 15, 16 years when you had literally an encyclopedia of spider villains that you could have used that could have made that a better movie. You know, it's like, ugh. Do you think we'll see Spawn reboot with Jamie Locks? I don't know. It's taking them forever to just get a script down. Bane's daddy. Yeah, whatever. Now, I, listen. 
I just think I, name. I mean, name any even you animated uh, series guys. You seen the uh, the the collection of, of villains, uh, better superior villains that that Batman has. We've done the Bane thing, and it honestly wasn't good either time. So why don't we when we give Batman a thought provoking villain, he does well. All right, the Riddler was great in the Batman. I Destro, I mean, even though he's a Titans villain, he's still somewhat of a Batman villain. But there's just so many, you know, really good. I mean, Clayface would be great. Um, you've already seen the Penguin. I mean, you, you I mean, you just just so many other Batman villains that I would, that I would like to see. You know, and he's just not one of them. He's just not one of them. I mean, the. Jamie Foxx is not attached to Spawn. McFarlane said he didn't need him. Okay, well, McFarlane's going to have to hand that over. No, let's not. Tom Hardy is far from me. Yeah, so, so you know, I think Tom Hardy did as good a performance as Bane as you can with such a shitty character. With all due respects for the per- people who created Bane, this is not a knock on them. They created him as a story device for an evolution of what Batman was. And to be honest with you, it was very limited. It was, it, as long as you used him in a limited uh, uh, purpose, you know, fine. But they don't. They make him into this all, you know, encompassing enemy. And he's just not that. Yeah. Here you go. All right. So we are at 43 minutes. Uh, let's see the trades lie. I'm only gonna say they lie. Like I said, they just give you enough. They give you enough to go running into the wall wanting more. Like I said, give me, give me, give me a quarter of a crack rock, not the whole rock. Just give me a quarter. Oh, I'm high. Give me more. Oh, you're hooked now. They keep you coming to them, you know, because they're using their name and their credibility and their historical relevance, and they know that you. Oh, it's got. It's coming from Variety. It must be true. Hollywood Reporter, oh, it's gospel. When we have read on this very show, word for word, some ambiguous bullshit that gave you nothing, didn't lie to you, but gave you nothing. And watched everybody like rats in a maze go fucking crazy over it. So, yeah. Nah, Ben Affleck is a legit 6 four. All right, Terry, don't 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 flirt with disaster here. Justice for all. I don't know. All the '80s Metallica albums are classic. I I lean towards Ride. You know what? I, I, I'm going to time you out. How do I time you out from here? No, I'm just kidding. Shogun. Uh, for me, the song uh, the song Riding the Lightning has the best mouth. Ooh, the fighting words. <clears throat> Those are fighting words, man. I don't know about that. Why are we gonna have to have another Metallica stream? I know people who think the Black Album is Metallica's best. Um, I look at those people like they're nuts. It's not the best. Like I already told you that that I, in my opinion, um, Justice for All is just in its own planet, and then everything else is afterwards. I can't really argue with anybody if they came up to me and told me second best for a Black Album. I know there are other historical songs on all the other albums, but the Black Album has, I mean, a lot of hits. The Unforgiven is is one of the, you talk about one of the great guitar solos of Metallica, the Unforgiven's guitar solo is, 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 is epic. Sad But True, Sad But True is literally like an anthem for a generation. The God That Failed, I mean, you can't go wrong with any anything off that album. Of Wolf and Man, I know it's not it's because it's a, it's a sellout album, but it's a really good album. If you came to me and told me that the Black Album was re- as long as you agreed that uh, Justice for All is number one, you you could make a you could make a clear cut argument for the Black Album being number two. Integrity, no doubt, last year was a huge wake-up call on the trades and their inside information. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. (coughs) 
the song Master of Puppets, yeah, the entire album, I couldn't put it above uh, Justice Raw. Um, I don't think Todd McFarlane should direct. Yeah, yeah, he he needs to he needs to let somebody do the film work. Yeah, but Terra's all right. Uh, integrity throws people around the mosque, especially those who are anti Snyder. Who, yeah, no violence. I'm more of a power metal fan, especially a uh, European. Like you know, yeah, some of that stuff is really good. As I was uh, going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm on Ben and Joe right now, dude. It's, it's too much math for me. I hope not. I hope not, but you know we probably will. Depends on who's writing them. A lot of the people who write uh, Batman don't seem to give... Uh, Credence to what era he's <clears throat> supposed to be from. Because Batman Year One is still good. Um, I would say post crisis. Because, like I said, from 1986 on, people wrote Batman in their own gritty way. So I would say post crisis. <clears throat> Batman and Spider-Man Rose Galaxy are so deep. I hate that we keep seeing the same villain. Yeah. I mean, come on now. You know? Give me give me a little bit uh give me a little bit of depth there. Pre-crisis. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So I'm gonna go with post-crisis. When it comes to Batman, Superman's a different story. Batman, post-crisis. Hello, Belle. How you doing? All right, if they're going to properly chronicle the characters in a multiverse and have you have seen familiar villains again. <laughs> we get, uh, yeah. I agree. See, I would like to see a live action play. I'm so would I. Especially with today's effects, is kind of what you could do. Uh, yes, please hit the like button, pretty much. Yeah, this whole thing with Tom McFarlane and the Spawn has been going on too long. Just get to it, man. Thoughts on Atomic Blonde? One of the most underrated movies ever. I love Atomic Blonde. <coughs> Charlie, it's my favorite Charlize Theron movie. And that's where I first got to see Sophia Batella, who's now in Rebel Moon. Uh, played, played in The Mummy. I love Atomic Dude, the violence in Atomic, in the fight scenes in Atomic Blonde are, are great. And it's a great Cold War movie. If you have not seen Atomic Blonde, or um, there's a, it's based on a uh, graphic novel. It's based on a graphic novel, and I actually have that. Um... Let's see, dude, it's, it's, it came out in 2017. Jeez, it needs to, it needs to. Uh, they need a sequel for this. All right, let's see, Atomic Bond. I forgot the, uh, I think it's called A Long Winter or something, A Winter. It revolves around a spy who is in class. All right. Yeah, an adapted, an adapted adaptation, The Coldest City. I'm sorry, The Coldest City, Berlin. Um, and Cold City as a reference to the Cold War. So um, I have that graphic novel at the store, and that movie's great. I even have the pop figure. I have her uh, as, as a pop figure. So, yeah, that movie's great. Timo Bill, fourth, I said hi. 35 watching, uh, 20 likes, hit the like button. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of people watching tonight. Uh, Kevin O'Docker is, dude, is that your real name? <laughs> That's cool if it is. Fourth day, I heard about five, seven years ago. I'm still waiting. Yeah, we're talking about Spawn. We're going to be waiting until we're in our 70s. Um, just random stuff. Um, how I hate fan casting. <laughs> or uh, how, you know, how I, well, the dangers of fan casting and just, you know, just random stuff uh, that, you know, establishing that uh, Injustice for All is the best Metallica album and that anybody who thinks so is wrong and that uh, Deckard is a replicant. Yeah, just getting a lot off my chest. 
treat the Hollywood trades with a grain of salt. They get things very wrong sometimes. Yeah, and then, you know, it, and like I said, a partial truth is as bad as anything else because it sends you scurrying about trying to figure out shit. Darcy, you know, we haven't established anything. You established everything in your own mind. Uh, talk, any Metall- take, talk to any Metallica fan, either Master or Lightning is the best album. And yes, William Decker is no, no. Don't make me come down there, Darth. I know plenty of Metallica fans that that regard the one and true king of all Metallica albums, which is Injustice for All. Any Metallica, I'm a Metallica fan, so we we already you know we're already off there. Deckard, Deckard is a replicate. When we do our um, Blade Runner, another Blade Runner stream, I'm gonna bring you on. We're gonna have a moderator. We're gonna like we're gonna we're gonna plead our case, and then we're gonna have the, the fans vote on the evidence. Damn it, Darth. Only superhero anything is a uh, bah. Damn, I'm 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 waiting for uh, across the Spider Verse. Uh, um, the Flash. Okay, and you got Matt. You got Brian to kill them all. Kill them all is raw. Um, it is their it is Metallica in their rawest form. It's their first album, their first studio album, if you want to call it studio. Uh, but did the bass solo, Cliff Burton's bass solo. Even if you don't like Kill 'Em All as an album completely, I mean, it's a great album. It's just you know, it's not at the top for me, but it's still great. <coughs> when you hear Pulling Teeth, when you hear Cliff Burton in that bass solo. I've never, that was the first time I'd ever, I didn't know you could do a bass solo until I heard him do that. It is, it is like a symphony. Rest in peace, Cliff Burton, but there's a bass solo on Kill Em All called Anastasia Pulling Teeth. Anastasia Pulling Teeth. You need to hear it. It's on YouTube. It's underrated because it was, it was, it was a breakthrough album. You know, they, like I said, it's them in their Ross form. So, but yeah. See, when did they become mainstream? A lot of people think the Black Album, but that Black Album is still revolutionary Metallica. It's still some of the best Metallica out there, in my opinion. Hits load and reload, hits tat hit. Yeah, we were talking about that last uh, last Saturday, Brian. Um, like the Memory Remains. I love the Memory Remains. I love um, um, Unforgiven too. You know, I didn't like the majority of those releases, but they had hits. They had hits. And when I went to go see them in concert, they they played those hits. So yeah. All right, so Bill, we kind of went through the, the Momoa, Aquaman, Lobo rant. Uh, Ratcatcher Two as Wonder Woman. Tired of cryptic announcements. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to. I'm ready to get it. You know, get my daily dose of gun information. Yeah. Hey, Pink, speaking of Pink Floyd, dude, it's been 50 years since the release of Dark Side of the Moon. 50 years. Uh, we got to do a thing where we uh, play Wizard of Oz, and if you started at the third line drawer, you can have Dark Side of the Moon playing along, and it syncs up. We've done that here at the center before. It's hilarious, but uh, yeah, I think that the um, best Pink Floyd album. It, 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 I'm biased because it was the album that was around when I was growing up. It was around. It was the first album that was released while I was alive, or of you know of age to understand music, and that was uh, the Wall. You know, I I heard that in school. You know, we don't need no. I mean, they drilled that into your head in school, and that's how I found out who and what Pink Floyd was. <laughs> yeah, and she's probably like 110 pounds, but like I said, throw her in the gym. If you're going to do it, throw her in the gym, throw her in the makeup chair. A Lobo movie will flop. Nobody knows who that is. I, I, it, I perform just as well as back in. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you rerun that risk? He's a C-lister. Adam West is my second uh, favorite Bruce Wayne. Super smooth. I mean, when I was a kid, he was because that's the only Batman I knew. Um, ben Affleck, to me, is you know because he plays my favorite version of the character. Gotcha. Oh, that I cannot do. <laughs> that I cannot do. <laughs> The guitar solo in Unforgiven 2 is epic, but it's only epic because it is a continuation 
from Unforgiven. So I, I guess it all it de- depends on who you are and where you were at when you first heard that song. Because music is different from one person to another. Sometimes a musical album and, and what is best and, you know, what is, you know, second and third best, a lot of times depends on how you were feeling when you first heard it. It's, it's, it's not as much the music sometimes as it, is, as it is the moment. Because if the moment matches up to the movie, the music, the music is like a soundtrack to whatever you're going through. So for people who think um, this Metallica album is better than this one, a lot of it is going to be how, what were you going through when you first heard it? And how those songs and that that rhythm resonated with you at that time, and that's going to be different for every every person. Okay, Bill took a selfie. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Uh, wasn't my favorite. All right, at William, if you get hired at DC to run everything, you were in charge. What is your plan for Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman? Okay, so um. I personally would, um, I wouldn't do a reboot. I would focus the next three years heavily on the Trinity. I would not recast Gal Gadot. I would not recast Jason. You know, I wouldn't recast any of those guys because I think there's money to be made off of those guys there. Um, if they ask me, you know, we want to new this, new that, I'm like, okay, I will do it. But I'm, I'm insistent upon ending this properly and then using that ending to, for your beginning. But yeah, I would, I would do, um, uh, I would have, um, released another Superman movie first and foremost. I mean, that seemed to be a priority as Aslov. I would have, obviously we got another Iron, uh, uh, Aquaman movie coming. I would release a Wonder Woman three, but I would not have Patty Jenkins on it. I think she has drifted away from what that core character was. And I think a lot of Zack Snyder's DNA was in the way that that character was presented. And that character is an ass kicking Amazon who takes people's heads. I would do another one Roman movie where, you know, it, it, uh, it refers to that. And then I would end the Snyderverse. I would, I would, I would, I would have an end game to the Snyderverse, you know, because the reality is, is these, these people are getting up there they are moving on to other projects, and you're not going to have them for the next 10 years. I would have a 10-year plan, and it would include a new Justice League, new Superman, new Batman, but it would be done in a manner that strengthens the lineage of what we just saw and gives you a catapulting force of momentum going into the future. That's what I would do. All right, guys, we are at, we were at an hour, so we're going to wrap it up here quick here. All right, Chappie, what do you think? That's a lot of uh that's a lot of D's gritters that gritters that always do outrage. Oh, grifters that always do outrage videos. Uh everything is woke. This just want to be the next Alex Jones. Uh, it is for the money. Most of those guys, you they're they're, they're doing it for the money. They're no longer, in my opinion, using the platform or the form of self-expression. They're just they're just trying to get you to click. You know, that's that's pretty much what they want to do. She needs to stay rat catcher. I'd say the Dark Knight Returns is a sequel of the pre-crisis universe. Eh, that's interesting. Charlie said, "Yes, yeah, she she's great in Atomic Blonde. That is a that is a sorely underrated movie. Did it make a lot of money? All right, the but oh yeah, the budget was thirty million. They made that movie for thirty million. They made a hundred million, so they made seventy million in profit. It's pretty good." That's what, yeah, she did heavily under heavy, heavy makeup, too. No doubt, I get Wonder Woman vibes from her. I get, I get no Wonder Woman vibes from her. I like hotel. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Let's see, yeah, at different points of their career. Yeah, you can see that. Gina Davis from Lunch, uh, kids is good, uh, versus Charlotte Stern, Atomic Blonde, who wins, uh, Charlie Stern. Uh, Dark Knight Returns came out. Yeah, because uh, Dark Knight Returns is actually considered an alter reality. It was the first Metallica fan, the first one. Period. Yeah, something Doom City or some shit like that. I, don't, I saw the previews for it. Yeah, Doom that came to Gotham. There you go. All right, Bell will fight you on Megadeth versus my Metallica. 
Um, I'm you're I'm gonna win that battle. Um, I as great as Megadeth is, um, I just Vitalik is just better on every level. That's not a knock against Megadeth, but if you were going to match the two together. Now, once again, if your pre- if your preference is more thrash, then it's Megadeth. No, 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 no doubt. If your preference is more more heavy metal, then it's going to be a doubt. So it's really no battle. It just depends on what you want to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, like I said, it's uh, Tom and Vaughn also features Daniel Bernard, who made that epic uh, Barry episode. <coughs> never seen Barry. I know it's, I know I have it on HBO Max, but I've never seen Barry. Hold on for a second, guys. Yeah, a lot of people are both. And if you listen to early Metallica, you can kind of see the influences that Dave Mustaine had on, you know, because he's credited with with some of the songs that are on Kill 'Em All. He was he was he was part of the band when that um uh, album. If you listen to early early um Megadeth and early Metallica, you can see the parallels. They evolved to two different directions. Um, Metallica evolved as more stable heavy metal, in my opinion, and Megadeth stuck with thrash throughout. I mean, there's with very few exceptions. I mean, you know, like Sympathy of, of the Destruction is, is a mainstream hit, but even if you get that album, that's the rest of that album is thrash, so it, it, it just went in two different directions. Uh, Megadeth, yeah. We were talking the other day. What if what if what if Dave Mustaine doesn't get fired from Metallica and you don't have Megadeth? That's a scary world right there, isn't it? Batman Beyond Blade Runner style would be amazing. Uh, I would, you know, just for the Blade Runner aspect, I might watch it. I just I just can't get over doing a Batman that's not blue flame. But you know, it's just me. Uh, thank God they <laughs> thank God they fired me Mustaine. Uh, see. Uh, sad but true is like two people uh, made songs and couldn't agree which song to make, uh, so they decided to mesh them together wherever I may roam is uh, so much better. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love sad but true, but you know, once again, it's all gonna, it's all gonna depend on where perspective you're coming from. If you prefer more thrash, then uh, Megadeth is the best big band thrash that ever was. There are other thrash bands that people might think that are better, but as far as commercial and arena success, it's Megadeth. Heavy metal wise, because like I said, as you get past can kill uh, kill them all, and and most of the songs from the subsequent albums, there's not a lot of thrash. I mean, there are some fast songs, you know, but they're not like the level that um, Megadeth is. Megadeth is a thrash band that puts out some slower shit. Metallica is a heavy metal band that has some roots, and they fired one of those roots in Dave Mustaine. So it's not, they went in a different direction, in my opinion. That's just me, though. Replicants don't age. No, it's not true. They age to the point where they die. <laughs> Ride the Lightning is my shit. Oh, come on, Dad. Don't do this to me. I was kidding. Like I said, all these are subject. There's no right answer when it comes to who's in your favorite Metallica album. It's just how you're feeling. I have people who their first Metallica they ever heard was Sad But True. Yet, they're going to go buy those other albums and they're going to experience it in their own way. So, it's like, there you go. Dave and Stan had a big part in Ride the Lightning. Um, did, was he co-creator on that one? Or co, uh, was he given co-write? I, I thought he was only uh, given um, writing credits on um, Kill Em All. Hold on. Dude, fucking, uh, it's almost 40 years since Light and Lightning was released. Holy shit. Wow, fuck. 
Let's see real quick. Oh, I'm looking up all the history of this album, man. By the time I got my hands on this album, it was uh oh yeah, yeah. You're right. He he ride the lightning in title track. He's on he um he has writing credits on Ride the Lightning. I forgot all about that. Um Call a clue. Uh, he's got writing credits on that. That's what those are the two. Three. No, two. He's only got two on there. That's still impressive because he was long gone from the band. Oh, actually, no. He'd been two years removed from being fired from the band because Kill 'em All was released in 1983. That's 40 years since Kill 'em All's been released. Holy shit. Aren't my old? Uh, and Ride the Lightning was 1984. And so, yeah, so they basically used a lot of the material that was from. So, yeah, he has two, uh, he, he, and, uh, he's, he has two on there. Yep, he sure does. Wow. It's been so long since I looked at the writing credits of any of these albums. Uh, Kill Em All, Highly Underrated, I Agree, Holy Wars, Tornado of Souls. All, all great. Dark Side of Oz. Yeah, we've done that out here before. It's great. You know another band that just doesn't get a lot of mention when it comes to that level of metal? Slayer. I mean, for as big as Slayer was, Slayer is one of the big four. All right? They don't get nearly as much, uh, uh, as much play as a lot of other bands do. And if you listen, just listen to Rain of Blood, you'll, 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 you'll feel those influences everywhere there's a lot of slayer influences and a lot of stuff that a lot of people will never connect to them you know just bringing up another band early 2000 rock and metal was a good time lincoln park system of a down system of a down especially uh system of a down i think is i wish they would have put out more to be honest with you that's the only thing i don't like about the system of a down is they did not put out more stuff and if you ever listen to the song a loss in hollywood that is just you know, great stuff. Late eighties was my favorite. Late eighties was my favorite for that type of music, but my favorite era of music in, in general was the post grunge era, the alternative era from nineteen ninety three to nineteen ninety eight. I have never had a five year period of music like that match that. You know, the, the bands that were released, because a lot of those grunge bands that did stay around after the era were releasing their second albums and they were better. Pearl Jam's second album was better than than ten. All right, um, you had Bush, you had Smashing Pumpkins released their third album. The name released the double eight. All that happened between the night nineteen ninety three ninety nine. Soundgarden released their best uh, album and uh, uh, during that period, Super Unknown. I think it was uh, ninety five. So yeah, so, uh, the eighties were great, but I think from ninety three to ninety eight was my favorite era. We've got Mustaine stand. Oh, you can't really. It, well, it's it's kind of hard to 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 favor that genre of music and not have Dave Mustaine come up. You can't really talk early Metallica without Dave Mustaine coming up. Or even if you hate the guy, I don't hate the guy. He's kind of wacky, but you you just he has his place there. He has his place. He has roots in uh, the two great heavy metal bands of all time. He has roots in them. He literally has writing credits on two of the big four: Metallica and Megadeth. Am I evil? Yes, I am. Yep. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers. They had a good run from 88 to like um, uh, 93. I remember uh, when I was in basic training, there was a song called Sold to Squeeze, one of my favorite Red Hot Chili Pepper songs. Yes, but I don't have a lot of details, Freddie. I've heard of it, but I don't know the details of it. Yeah, there was a lot of that shit going on in the 80s. Nikki Six chased after a lot of people. Guns N' Roses did have a hell of a run. Um, that's so much for the uh, 45 minutes. That's an hour 10. Guns N' Roses, um, wow. Um, for the limited output that they put out, Appetite for Destruction is in my top 10 great albums, rock albums of all time. Hit after hit off that album. All right, and a lot of people that listen. This is back when the radio was. Oh, Welcome to the jungle. Oh, okay, I hated that song because it was a song that they just jammed down your eardrums. But you you listen to um, "Appetite for Destruction." 
Um, it's one hit after another. Night Train, Mr. Brownstone, Rocket Queen has two different two different songs in one, and some of the great guitar solo work of the '80s. Sweet Child of Mine. I mean, um, it's so easy. Uh, th- th- that whole album is just like legendary. And Use Your Illusion. Uh, wasn't a bad uh, release, and they released really stuff like some Spaghetti in it, Incident and some other stuff. But uh, their the two major main albums for GNR were were Appetite for Destruction and Use Your Illusion uh, One and Two. There's a song on Use Your Illusion Two called Coma. It's a ten minute song about suicide prevention. To be honest with you, they got a lot of heat for that song because they. they the radios and the media are like, you're endorsing suicide. No, listen to the fucking song, you dummies. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. But, but yeah, Appetite for Destruction was literally the benchmark of the, of, of the hairband 80s. All the other hairbands that were in the 80s, like Poison and all these other stuff, I'm sorry. I thought they were soft when you put them up against Appetite for Destruction. I'm sorry. That's just my opinion. Hot Take, Creeping Death is Metallica's best song. Um, like I said, I, I, I joke around, but I there's that's not a hot take at all. I mean, there are days where Sanitarium is my favorite song. I mean, and Justin, Justice for All in general is usually my, my mainstay. And then after that, it's Harvester of Starrow. Then after that, it's Un- Unforgiven. And then, then it's all over the place. But uh, Creeping Death is a great song. It's, it's not hot at all. Uh, Love Actual Road, too. He sucks live, though. Sorry, Actual, actual if you're watching this, sorry. We have the best studio voice of any of them, but I paid to see you live on several occasions, and you don't sound good live, in my opinion. Yeah, that was some crazy shit there. I remember all that. Another Superman where the fans would have uh, complained about this, the two color and theme. Yeah, they're gonna do that. They're all probably always gonna do that. Yeah, it is. Um, that nine, nine inch nails is actually good for the um. Look, uh, try doing your workout to a perfect jug. From Nine Inch Nails. And then follow it up with Terrible Eye from uh, Nine Inch Nails. You can lift some, you can pump some iron there. But if you're going to go with Metallica in the gym, like I said, just do the Black Album. If you try to go to the gym and, and do cardio with some of their other shit, you're going to die. <laughs> That's just too bad. You're gonna, your, your heart's going to explode. But if you want to build up something, I'm sad but true. That should be some good gym music. Uh, the God That Fell, you could, you could probably do deadlifts to that, you know? But yeah, it, it, it's good running music. I know when we were in the Army and we got to wear our earphones and we would run, we, we you know, it, it uh, a lot of Metallica stuff helped me uh, get my pace and uh, uh, for my, my to get my two mile time down. Keeping, uh, yep. Blackened, so is, but there's a lot of Metallica songs that are, that are slept on. No one, no one, rolling picks again. Tall and Bob. <laughs> Before we uh, go, uh, which unsolved mystery bothers you? The one that was Zodiac Killer. Zodiac Killer. Um, that's the one that would, would, would that haunts me. The one that haunts me that hasn't been uh, that hasn't been solved. There's only a few of them that I that are at the top of my head that haven't. I know there's a bunch more, but you got the Ripper murders and the Zodiac. Um. Zodiac, because it's no, I mean, even though it was decades before I was even, you know, or like 15, 20 years, 15 years before I was born. Actually, no, I was born in 74. So it's more contemporary. It's more modern. It's more in my era. The Ripper murders, like I said, would have been solved in like two days. It would have been like a TV, a two hour TV documentary, the the rise and fall of the Ripper. You probably wouldn't even have got five uh, victims. But um, the Zodiac killer is the modern one that they never caught. And it's like, you know that that one for some reason disturbs me more than any of the other ones goes. So. The mystery how Gun murdered the DCU. He hasn't let, given. Like I said, as aggravated as I am of how this is all coming about, I am still optimistic that he will do something that gets me going again. And if he doesn't, hey, the worst case scenario is I I just watch all the shit on HBO Max. Left hand wins. <laughs> I've been a huge uh, Anthrax kick lately. Yeah, yeah, those guys. I never really um, um, got into Anthrax. I respect Anthrax. Different type of speed for me. Just a personal preference. 
I like Scott Ian. All those guys are great guys. Um, um, I like what they do for the metal community. But their music just never really uh, resonated with me. Uh, Gun can go um, on Crin Haston's show and attempt at rape of DCU. Oh, I remember that show. Thrash metal, man. I haven't heard that in a minute. Yeah, man. I mean, I just listened to some today. <laughs> because, you know, with YouTube, I can just... I can just uh, have my little Google thing say, hey, Google, play uh, Blackened or play, um, you know, I, I, I had Rain of Blood. I had the whole album. I had Rain of Blood playing until customers came in. I had to turn that shit off. You can't have, uh, you can't, you really can't have Slayer playing uh, in a retail location. Uh, now, Megadeth's guitar riffs are way harder than Metallica's. Uh, okay, well, once again, from a thrash metal, speed metal point of view, 100%. I have no, I can't even, you know, begin to dispute that. But that's not where Metallica was going after a certain period of time. Early Metallica, yeah, if you want to match him up, but that was a lot of his influence. But as they progressed, as you got into 1986 and 1988 and 1991, they weren't that band anymore. They did some songs, but that wasn't their thing. Megadeth stayed thrash from beginning to end. They have a stage close to 60 and still make it thrash metal. So. so it's a different it's a different animal, you know. Yeah, no, I think some of them get don't some of them have a judge. Doesn't Scott Ian have like a Judge Dread, uh, Judge Death tattoo on his one? That's why Kill 'em All is good because David. I, I, there, there are some people that will say Kill 'em All is uh, like I said, it's it's them in their raw form. Like I said, Pulling Teeth is the greatest thing on that album. Okay. Daniel Martin uh, laughing at me. David Stand is a sax and rock. Okay, now that's, <laughs> that's a loaded one there, man. I like Metallica, but grunge was more my style. I was into the early 90s. The thing about grunge is most of those guys were on their second or third. They were early in their careers. And they're, I'm sorry, I know you, Nirvana fans, if you're in here, Bleach and Nevermind sucked. Sorry. All right, I didn't like those albums. I hated Smells Like Teen Spirit because that was a song that, that like I said, that they picked that one song and it was like, you know, and in bloom, I, I just, you know, I just didn't connect. However, In Utero was probably one of the best albums of that decade. When you hear heart heart shaped box, the difference of evolution, the, the, the different the different level of of ability between Nevermind and In Utero, it's like light years. It's like is that the same band? When you hear those same power chords that they're kind of using on uh, Nevermind, and you hear that orchestra that they're letting loose on you on In Utero, In Utero is is far superior. Album. Same thing with um. Now, when it comes to like Pearl Jam, Ken's a great album. Versus is a far superior album. Um, Soundgarden, a super unknown, once again, right in the top 10 of the best albums of it. And their second and their third albums were where they got great. And then everything kind of fell apart. It was almost like Grunge died in April 1994 when he died, even though those bands were still putting out music. Soundgarden was still putting out music. Pearl Jam put out three or four more albums. But you had that post grunge era where, like, Weezer, Smashing Pumpkins, Bush, those guys kind of took it to a different level for me. Metal. Yeah, here we go. Kill them all is always dope. Yep, that just, it's uh, Motorhead. Got to see Motorhead live. Got to see Motorhead live. I got to see them on um, in Pasadena, 1992. I I got to see him in 1992. It was um, it was Rob Halford, uh, Motorhead, Metallica, and Guns N' Roses. That was when they teamed up together. I saw them right the show after the Montreal show where James Hetfield burnt his hand up, and he wasn't playing guitar that day. It was some other stand-in, but I got to see them. And boy, when they played Ace of Spades, that the, the Pasadena Rose Bowl uh, exploded. 
But I, I, you know, and when he passed away, I was like, I was so, because I didn't appreciate Motorhead at the time I was watching them. I knew who they were. I knew who Lemmy was. But I, I didn't have, I was there for Metallica. I was there for Guns N' Roses. But when he passed away and I looked back at the fact that I got to see him live in October of 1992, I still have my ticket stuff from that somewhere. That to me, I was like, you know, I didn't get to see guys like Hendrix or I got never got the chance to see Freddie Mercury. But for the ones I got to see before they passed away, I got to see Van Halen before Eddie Van Halen passed away. I got to see BC Boys before he uh, Adam Yacht passed away. I mean, these are these are things that if you guys get chances to go see these people and if you can afford to, you know, kind of make the time to do it because you don't ever, you never know how long these guys are going to be around. They're not, maybe they won't make it till their sixties or seventies. Hard metal painters, <laughs> uh, Pantera. We can do some left Uh I like Fuel by Anthrax. Ah, uh, yeah, it is getting kind of late, guys. Actually, that was probably twelve minutes ago. <clears throat> and my, I'm I'm dealing with allergies right now. That's why you kind of you know see me get off screen every now and then because I had to take care of that. Um, so we will continue. We'll probably talk. Wow, there's a lot of you guys in here that were saying stuff. I don't want to leave you hanging, but okay. Yeah, it was all covers and it wasn't that good. All right. Um. Yeah. Uh, no, I was not infantry. I was a, I started out as an ammunition specialist and then I went over to transportation when I got deployed and cross leveled. Um, black guy likes, I I'm from Los Angeles. Um, we didn't have a segregated scene when I was growing up. If you liked heavy metal, you were an outcast period, white, black, Mexican. You, it was like stranger things were, were, uh, Eddie. We were those guys with those shirts. We sat in the corner. We were the guys that they thought were going to burn down the school. And we didn't have enough of us to really exclude anybody. So as long as you were into the music, somebody would, if you came over and they were playing it, you sat down, you liked it. The next day, somebody bought you a tape with all the shit on it. And that's how you got in. You were part of that brotherhood because at that time in the eighties, there just wasn't a lot of us and people weren't thinking, uh, we were all outcasts. So all those outcasts got gravitated together and it just, it just grew from there. So, all right, guys, I am going to, um, I'm going to get out of here because it is super late. I only meant to be on 45 minutes, and here it is, hour and a half. Uh, we will be back later on tonight with the overnight show, and we'll continue the rock conversation. There's never a bad time to bring up uh, music. Never a bad time. I and I, um, I love talking about it, but I do have to get to bed. I do have to rest my throat, and I do have to fight off this allergy madness that I've been going through the last couple of days. So thank you, everybody, that made this conversation interesting. And I will see you at 9:30 tonight for the uh, overnight edition of the Sci-Fi Center Live. We'll have some guests and we'll talk some uh we'll talk some more metal too. See you guys later.